Jonathan Weinberg. Um, today I would like to do something a little different, which is a lot of people have asked me to do things a little bit more about art history since I'm both an artist and art historian. And um, a lot of the artists that I look at and been influenced by actually don't use fountain pens. They, they worked before the invention of fountain pens. But their work inspires me, and there's there's probably no artist that I like more in works in pen and ink than um, uh, Rembrandt, who whose drawings I think are amazing, and his paintings are are amazing. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, some Rembrandt drawings, which I think are have certain qualities that I think are really useful if you want to make art and draw with a fountain pen. And uh, also one of my favorite paintings, which is The Prodigal Son. Uh, to do my um, emulations of Rembrandt, I'm going to use a pen that um, is called the Peter Draws pen. I think this might be the third version of this pen. Um, a signature version of it. When you get the pen, you get a little card with it, and it's signed by Peter uh, who is a vlogger and does these nice doodles. And um, last year, I really started um, back into my passion with fountain pens, and I started watching him, and I really enjoyed a lot of his um, videos. And he has collaborated with Navalar um, to, um, excuse me, Narval, to make these pens. And... Uh, they're limited editions, but now they're on their fourth uh, run of them. So I'm not so sure how limited they are, but um, each each uh, version of it only uh, amounts to a thousand pens. Um, and I think it's a very handsome pen. It's translucent, um, and I actually have the stub version of this of this pen which I think writes really, really nicely. So that's the pen I'm going to use. The pen actually posts, but it's a piston filler, so I would not post it. Um, you see it posts, but then it actually will turn the piston, and that'll get you in trouble. The ink will come out. So you, it, it's big enough so that you don't, you don't need to post. And another nice thing about it is you can see the ink sloshing around. I always like that, and it holds quite a lot of ink uh, in it, and it draws quite nicely, which you would expect from a pen that's called Peter Draws. Um, keep in mind that I don't work for Gold Spot Pens, and uh, I'm not getting any money um, for this uh, review. So Rembrandt, I think, is, is an amazing artist. That's a, an understatement. He's actually, I think, probably, he's only my favorite painter, and he's only one of the great, great painters. Um, I think one of the things that's incredible about Rembrandt's work is that he had this extraordinary facility, and uh, particularly in his early work, this incredible ability to do uh, illusionism uh, in his work and an extraordinary technique. But on the other hand, um, I don't feel it's the kind of art that is so extraordinary that it's intimidating. It inspires me to make drawings and paint from it. Partially, particularly in his later work, you you can um, or think you can see how the pictures are made. They don't hide the, the process. They seem to open up the process. And that's particularly true, I think, of his sketches and his drawings, which seem to be very accessible and very inspiring. Of course, in order to do something like that, to draw with such ease takes an amazing facility. But sometimes his drawing almost seems cartoonish, and yet it is so expressive. So when I see a drawing by him, I want to make drawings like that. Um, there are other artists. Let's take an artist, a contemporary artist, Dutch artist Vermeer, whose paintings are also amazing, but I couldn't even imagine a possibility of painting painting like Vermeer. So it has nothing that I can can borrow or emulate or steal from. But Rembrandt, I feel, is always teaching me things about light and dark and building up paint. And um, there's this sense of him almost carving out painting. So I love, I love that aspect of his work. Um, 
I'm going to focus on a theme that he approached a few times in his life. I think it meant a tremendous amount to him, which is the story of the prodigal son, which appears in um, Luke in the, in the New Testament. It's a story that Christ tells about um, uh, 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 two, two sons of a man, a wealthy man, and the younger son takes the money that his father is going to leave him, but gives it to him before he dies, gives him a bunch of money, and he goes away, and he spends it all on wine and women, presumably, and becomes impoverished, so impoverished that he has to work um, taking care of pigs, and he gets to the low points when he's almost eating from the trough of the pigs, and he decides, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to beg his forgiveness and I'm going to just work for him like a servant. And he goes back to his father and uh, his father is just takes him back and is so thrilled to see him. And he uh, even decides to have a big party for him. And the older son is, is furious because after all he was loyal to his father and his father says well but your younger son was dead and now he lives again he was lost and now he's found so there's the a lovely beautiful idea of forgiveness in this story and um and of learning and um and so it's very beautiful and um, Rembrandt seemed to identify really with at least two of the characters in the story because when he was younger, he did a fantastic painted self-portrait where he's the prodigal son with his uh, wife Saskia. And then um, uh, around the same time in the 30s, 1630s, he does um, um, a beautiful, um, draw some beautiful drawings based on it and prints. And then finally, at the end of his life, he does this very famous painting that was in his studio when he died. They, they now think that some of the painting may have been done by a follower of Rembrandt, kind of finished it. But um, I think that painting is, is one of the most moving pictures ever done. And this sort of image of reconciliation between father and son is so beautiful, the idea of forgiveness. But also probably Rembrandt had had not that long before lost his son, so I think Adept had died, um, and I think the painting is in some ways about that, the fantasy almost of, of coming together with this lost son, um, perhaps the idea even that he's going to die but see his son in heaven. It has all, all these aspects of it um, in the background. Um, you can see the older son looking kind of bitter, um, there's that kind of conflation in the story, putting all the elements in the story into one picture, um, because in the story itself, the, the father, the son, the older son is not in the scene when the two are reconciled, but Rembrandt has perhaps gone further. The other figures, we don't really know exactly who they are, and perhaps they are uh, the servants who um, the younger son says that he's going to be like them uh, to the father, uh, we don't we don't know. Um, I mean, they're witnesses in a way. They they fulfill the same role that we as the viewer play when we look at the scene. Um, there's also a beautiful sort of aspect of how the father, uh, in his clothing and the way he holds his son to his breast, um, has a kind of feminine quality as well. So it's sort of his father and mother to him in this in this wonderful wonderful scene. Okay. So, uh, in terms of learning from Rembrandt's drawings, the thing to be said is that Rembrandt didn't use a fountain pen. He undoubtedly used a quill pen to draw, to draw with. They didn't have fountain pens. And a quill has a kind of flexibility to it that, um, as we know, uh, modern flex pens, some of them have some flex to them, some, but nothing like the old, the old flex and pens. And even the best flex pen from the early part of the 20th century is not going to have the flexibility of a quill pen or the qualities of a quill pen. But I, I'm i not um, advocating here uh, and don't really do very much where I copy a drawing precisely and try to get it and uh, make my drawing look exactly like another drawing. I, that can be a really useful thing to do. It's just not something that I 
want to do here. It's not something that I do very often. What I often do like to do is sketch from another work of art has a way, first of all, it helps you look at the picture. You, you take the time to really see it um, like that. It's a way to kind of um, uh, learn from it, inspire yourself as if you were drawing from another scene is really the way I think about it. Uh, Rembrandt himself uh, learned from other artists. One of, one of the amazing things about Rembrandt is he actually didn't travel very much in his lifetime. He never went to Italy, for example, but he had a wonderful collection of prints of, of works by people like Raphael and Leonardo. And we have drawings by Rembrandt from other artists, in particular Leonardo da Vinci. He did um, a few drawings after Prince of the Last Supper. And then there's another uh, wonderful example of Van Gogh, who um, also a Dutch artist, I guess one could say Van Gogh. Um, but anyway, um, Vincent uh, loved Rembrandt's work, and he, he loved to make pictures based on other artists' work. And one of his wonderful paintings is um, a version of the raising of Lazarus, which the composition he takes from a kind of close-up of a terrific Rembrandt etching. So with that in mind, uh, you know, these great artists, uh, I don't think of myself as being on their level, but I'm using them as a model. Um, I uh, am drawing from a reproduction of the prodigal son and focusing in like Van Gogh on just the father and son in my drawing that I'm using a fountain pen with. Um, I also use, um, I start with pencil and wash because that's something that Rembrandt did. So he's not just using a quill pen, he's using uh, a brush. And sometimes you can see in his drawings that he actually adds some white uh, highlighting to the, to the drawing, pencil, um, graphite, chalk, whatever, whatever is gonna do the, do the job. And uh, in this case, I'm using some brown watercolor and uh, Waterman Brown ink and the Peter Draws stub pen to, to draw the, uh, my picture. All right, so I'm starting out with pencil. And um, one of the things that happens when you're, when you're drawing from uh, another work of art is you tend to make things bigger that you find more interesting. And, and one of the things I, I guess would be, I find a little odd about the painting is how the father's head has a quality of sort of small. His head is kind of small, but that happens with old people there. They kind of shrink. And so I think when I copied this and focusing on the father and son, I intended to make the head of the father bigger. And uh, so that's something that was happening. And here I'm putting in some washes, um, you know, to try to sort of suggest some of the form and the light and dark qualities of the sort of figures emerging. One of the things that's really interesting about copying works of art, particularly paintings, is that you're sort of copying them in the reverse order of the way they're done. You're copying the outside of the picture. And of course, the picture as it was done was created in layers and built up. And so you don't really have access to the bottom, the underneath of the picture. So you're painting, you're, you're working from the surface, the skin of the picture. So that's an interesting um, aspect of it. Um, one thing you notice with a fountain pen, I've noticed this too, that if I put a lot of watercolor down, the pen has a tendency not to quite absorb as well into the, the paint. And, I, and also I, I allowed the, um, the watercolor to dry first before I start drawing on it. If I hadn't done that, the ink would have sort of, sort of uh, ghosted out and that would not have been good. Um, the pen held up pretty well. It skipped a bit, but again, I think that's partially the, uh, because of the, what the uh, paint does to the paper. And then the other thing about a stub nib is it has a kind of sweet spot and I draw really fast and, you know, and it kind of gets scratchy. But thank you. Also, I think it's very expressive and I kind of, kind of like that aspect of, of it. 
Um, the hard part using a fountain pen uh, in this order was sort of trying to get a bit of the sense of the incredible light and dark qualities, the emerging of the chiaroscuro um, that uh, Rembrandt gets. And then I mentioned, you know, I mentioned Rembrandt learned so much from Leonardo. Leonardo really is the artist who really first really develops chiaroscuro, the dark shadow, the light coming out of the shadows. And Rembrandt then develops that. The way he does this in pain is that he first lays down the, the whites, actually, in opaque, thick, uh, um, lead white paint. You can't use lead white paint today anymore, but he builds that paint up. And then he, he uses glazing to sort of reduce some of the qualities. And also, what happens in Rembrandt is the shadows are, where, are actually quite translucent, um, and that gives them a lot of light, um, while the bright areas are actually done with the opaque paint, and that makes them brighter. It's something that you get into when you use oil paint, but it almost seems kind of paradoxical. paradoxical. And it's, it's quite sculptural, too. The light areas are the thickest and kind of... Uh, and that's hard to get in a drawing. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. That's the best way to support it. 